I'm Wahid Mahmoud. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I've been reading some of your work. I, 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 I will discuss you. Nice. Great. You have the Psychological Foundation for my Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm
This is a this is very much a, it's a framework talk about the whole yeah. of the um, framework. Um, but we've got the three projects for starting. I say do do an investing as well for cover. Okay. So I've got three uh, uh, four bank um, urbanization and development mm-hmm. has to go global bit, some sort of cross city, cross country stuff, but mainly Getting some things done to match that uh, from the studio line in the middle. Um, Yeah, Yeah, that's great. And I think that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the four week world picture down in the middle has a central garden. Good afternoon. We think we should start taking our places. We are seven minutes late um, already, so those who agree, you might join us for some Q and A. Okay, let's start then. Um, the session today is on cities. We're going to start uh, the present first presentation is going to be by Professor Tony Venables. He's going to talk conceptually about cities, a way of thinking about cities, different types of cities, um, which is going to be setting the stage a little bit for our discussion, which is going to be followed up by Professor uh, Fadilim Mahmoud. He's a professor of economics at the University of Dhaka. Um, Dhaka in itself is a very interesting city to think about the future of cities in developing countries, together with Lagos, for example. Um, so he's going to be discussing 
um, the experience, a little bit of the experience of, of Dhaka and the con in, in the context of developing country cities. This is going to be followed by Professor Ashraf. Um, she's an associate professor at the Harvard Business School and also the lead academic for Zambia. Um, we have an active interest at the IGC on cities, as you know, is one of our focus areas and Zambia is putting a lot of effort in trying to have a better understanding, a better grasp of those cities. I think there are many, issue, many relevant issues, um, maybe the most important of which is the fact that most of the world population is now concentrated in cities. We have part, a significant part, 2.7 billion in cities above 750,000 uh, inhabitants, so you see that's very significant. And the trend is unabated. The next um, decades, we are going to be a lowering of, you know, we're already observing a lowering of population growth rates, but an increasing rate of urbanization. Okay, so with that, I'd like to pass the stage to Professor Tony Bennett, who's our main person Thank you. Thank you Great, thank you, Claudia. framework session, I believe they're called. So this is going to be a framework paper, um, which is to say it's not going to be presenting research findings. It's going to be laying out issues, and I suppose the sort of conceptual framework that uh, I think is simple, but I think powerful in thinking through some of the key issues uh, and the key trade-offs uh, that arise in, in thinking about policy uh, and, and, and the growth of cities. Uh, the timing of this talk is, is in, in some ways fortunate and in other ways unfortunate. I mean, not the timing this afternoon, I mean the timing across years. Um, we're just starting a very large project uh, on urbanization in developing countries. Um, by, by, by we, I mean uh, Vernon Henderson at LSE, Paul Collier and myself at Oxford, and a number of other staff, at least three or four of whom are uh, dotted around the room. So, so a major project looking partly across city at patterns of city growth, um, but also delving deeply into selected cities to try and figure out how they've evolved, what policies got right, uh, what policies got wrong, and really lo looking at the number of African cities in the first instance to, to, to try and build this picture. So the timing, yes, yeah, it's, it's um, good to give a framework point at that stage uh, where you're planning the research. But it's not a we, but we don't have the results, so it's, it's certainly uh, not, not a research tool. Okay, well, introduction. Uh, you've already heard it this morning from the minister, from others, uh, the, 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 the challenge of, of urbanization. Um, the sorts of numbers uh, you've probably seen before, I put them there again, uh, two and a half billion new urban dwellers. And that means, well, for Africa, it's, it's, it, it, it's what is it? It's, um, Two Londons every year have to be built uh, somehow for the next you know, 20 or 30 years. So the scale of the challenge uh, brings it home to you. Um, that's the flow challenge. The stop challenge, Africa is about one third of, its, of the way through the urbanization process, um, which sounds scary, but maybe that's good news. There's scope for learning. Research at this stage hopefully can uh, you know, illuminate things uh, and possibly So there's that quantitative challenge, but there's also, well, what, what, what do we think about cities? Well, we all, we all live in cities, or almost all of us, right? I mean, we, we know that cities are wonderful places. And yeah, they're wonderful for two reasons. One is that we love living in them. They're you know, fantastically lively, livable places. Um, and the other is they're productive places. Um, evidence I'll show you later on about cities uh, having, having high productivity. So it's surely going to be the case that long-run growth in Africa or wherever else uh, is, is going to be driven uh, by, by the performance of cities. So African cities, a lot of developing country cities, we look at them now and think, well, they're not actually delivering either, either productivity or livability. But those are the two things that we, we treasure, that we know cities can, can deliver. So the challenge really is to uh, get policy investments uh, in line to make sure that this next two-thirds of African urbanization 
It's those two overarching objectives of livability uh, and productivity. It's a framework I'm going to lay out. So let me start off by saying, you know, what, 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 when I start thinking about cities, what are the, uh, what are the component parts? Uh, what, what the, um, how do I think about the elements? Well, I guess cities have got three sorts of components, right? One is residential stuff. Housing, the housing, the capital stock, the structures uh, that people live in. Right? That's, that's one of the elements. The second element is it's got business stuff. You know, workplaces, factories, offices, whatever, um, where people have jobs. And the third element is the urban infrastructure. So that's the utilities, the road network, the services, the infrastructure interpreted pretty, pretty broadly uh, that holds these things together. So they're the three elements that I'm going to organize the talk around that I want you to, 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 to hold in mind. But of course, the key thing is, well, how do those elements interact? You know, are they just deposited randomly? Or do they form a coherent urban form that will deliver the productivity and livability uh, that, that we ultimately care about? Okay, so it's going to be the urban form that enables people from get to houses, from, from their houses to their jobs, and so on. That, that shape of the city uh, that's going to be at the heart of what I'm talking about. Okay, so you've got these elements, they've got to somehow be coordinated. Well, how do different elements get coordinated? Well, you know, economists are always going to say, yeah, markets, right? Markets are going to coordinate things. And of course, they're crucially important, um, all sorts of markets. But I guess particularly for land, because once you get into cities, it's, it's land that is the scarce factor. You know, activity is kind of crammed together, and the extent to which it can is well, it's constrained by the geography, by land. So, so markets are one crucial uh, coordinating mechanism. But of course, not the only one. Uh, the way that the infrastructure is laid out is going to shape the relationship between the housing, the, the, the residential, the commercial, and so on. So infrastructures, uh, the second coordinating element. And the third is regulation. Uh, once you get the intense interaction social economic interaction that goes on in cities. Yeah. There are externalities of all sorts. There are public goods and uh, the volume of public investment. And there's surely a strong, strong case for regulation. So we've got these three elements, uh, millions of people, and various coordinating mechanisms, markets with failures, policy, trying to do things but with failures. And it's going to be the interplay between those objects that I really want to talk about. So I'm going to start off giving you a very simple framework uh, of how the components fit together. Then I'm going to discuss the three component elements in turn and some of the economic issues that arise, and then uh, hopefully draw some policy conclusions out at the end. So that's the plan of what I'm doing. Okay, it's a framework talk, so you're getting a framework. Um, the, 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 the simplest <laughs> economic model, but one that you know, I, th I think yeah, it's simple enough to really hold in your head. Right? <laughs> Uh, the diagram is going to be tweaked a bit as we go through uh, into different, different contexts and things. But think about it. Yeah, a city is a structure of the three structures, the residential structure, the housing, the, 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 the business structure, uh, and infrastructure. It's a uh, geography of those things uh, spread around the center. We think that jobs are largely it's the wrong word, disproportionately concentrated in the center of the city, not exclusively, not even largely, but yeah, disproportionately the center of the city is doing the, the business stuff, doing, doing, doing the jobs, and the residential and other jobs spreading out around that center. So this is the classic you know, textbook monocentric uh, city model. And of course the thing on the right is a sort of map of that. So the CBD is, is the center and there's a disk and that horizontal axis is just one slice out of the center uh, across that disk. So as you move out, uh, there's residential population, uh, you know, the first person accumulating up uh, as, 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 as you go out. What are the other ingredients we need here? Well, okay, the jobs, let's suppose for the moment that they're just offering productivity WU, that's the urban wage, and for the moment let's just take that as 
And there's an outside wage, W0, what you will get uh, if you are outside. And let's have WU greater than W0, so the city is drawing in workers from outside. But of course there are urban costs, right, of all sorts. But the simple textbook one is there are commuting costs. Uh, so the jobs are disproportionate in the centre, the workers are piling up outside. So that commuting cost line uh, is the uh, cost, is there a pointer? Is there a pointer? No. Okay, but in that wedge, right, further out the higher the commuting cost, it's obvious at any point. Okay? Um, so those costs go on, and the equilibrium city size is where the urban wage net of the commuting costs paid by the marginal worker, the guy on the edge who has to come all the way in from you know, the edge of the city, right, where that equals the outside wage. Right? So that's the basic monocentric urban model. I want to tweak it, I want to use it a bit. Uh, but of course you only write down a model if you're going to draw some implications out of it. Well, what, immediately, what, what are the messages from here? Well, if we make what is for the moment just an assumption that the urban productivity is higher than the outside, then cities are obviously creating a surplus. They're creating an economic good by putting people in this high productivity place. But some of that surplus gets thrown away, gets dissipated in the commuting cost. That's a real cost people have to pay. That's the triangle labeled as the commuting cost, okay? The remaining part of the surplus is the rent, the pure, pure economic surplus uh, created in a market economy, that is literally rent. It's, it's accruing to the landowners. Um, but of course, the point I want to note immediately is that the surplus area, that total rent, is going to be greater well, the better the city is functioning, the lower are the commuting costs, or the higher is the population density. Right? I've slipped past you. The horizontal axis is actually a cumulative population, not distance. So you can obviously cram more population into a unit distance the denser uh, the accommodation, uh, the denser the city is operating. Right? Um, so the fatter that line means either lower commuting costs or higher density means the greater is um, the surplus uh, that the city is creating. Okay, so simple structure, what I've, you know, I've got these three ingredients, uh, coordinating mechanisms, filling together in the textbook urban model. Some messages immediately and some issues. Okay, and residentially, you know, what are the barriers to achieving high density and, and getting acceptable quality housing? So I won't talk about that at the moment. Businesses, what determines productivity? It's not just a straight line there. Uh, let's think about what determines productivity a little bit harder. And then the third ingredient, uh, the commuting costs and the density and the simple story, or more generally, uh, the infrastructure. So with this framework in mind, they're the issues I want to take up. But before leaping into issues, it's, it's, it's a talk on cities. So we've got to have a few maps and charts and things. So I really uh, like those. The simple monocentric model sounds you know, excessively <laughs> simple. But of course, look at some cities. Um, yeah, employment is clustered in the centre. I hope this is. This is, this is from other people at LSE. If you see the bottom right hand corner. Um, so this is giving. Uh, this is employment density for, for those three cities. So yeah, the notion that stuff is disproportionately concentrated in the centre works pretty well, right? For London, yeah, it's 140,000 people per square kilometre uh, working in the city. It's astonishing numbers, and I think. I think that's the city, I think that's Canary Wharf, I guess that's Croydon or somewhere, I, I, I think this is looking from the east, not completely sure. Uh, New York, similar pattern, Hong Kong, so enormously, you know, the, the monocentric story rings true, enormously concentrated, uh, employment density, and residential density, again the gradients uh, from the centre outwards, uh, much less in London uh, than yeah, Hong Kong, obviously a uh, high-rise residential city with particular constraints of physical geography. But still, you know, the centre, the density gradients uh, seem uh, to hold in most cities. 
This is from work by Alan Berteau some years ago, looking at these uh, gradients, re these, re these residential uh, density gradients uh, across cities. Obviously, they've all been um, put on the same scale to illustrate, well, it's illustrating two things. One, how widespread this, the, the, the high density in the center gradient out is across all sorts of cities. But of course, the height of this thing uh, varies. You know, this is Atlanta, these are the American cities on the bottom, that Shanghai. Um, yeah, if it's bicycle technology getting you into the center, uh, you do that. If it's motor car technology, you do that. So you know, cities, the, the way they're, 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 they're all organizing in this manner, but very different, to very different extents according to the technological circumstances when they were built and path dependence when they were built uh, is going to matter quite a lot from what I'm saying. That sort of makes the same, I don't know whether this is, well, that, this is just making the point about the difference between you know, the American cities here and the Asian ones here with uh, on population density. But more interesting, I just said, well, that previous slide, okay, they all look like they've got this nice, well-ordered form, density in the center, you know, great, perfect. Uh, let me show you a few that hasn't, that haven't got that. This is Gauteng region. Now, it's, it's, it's to a different scale. Now, you've got Pretoria and Johannesburg, so it's a much wider thing. But obviously, it's not exhibiting any sort of central point <laughs> coming out. You've got um, Johannesburg here and most of its labor force over there, right? That looks like urban form that isn't that clever. But you know, workers from there are supposed to go to there every day. Um, let me put it on the same sort of pictures you were looking at a moment ago. Uh, Johannesburg there. So that you know, should be one of those nice gradients. But obviously, it's not. So these are cities well, with, not market, with, with particular outcomes. <laughs> so it's not just absence of markets that did uh, Johannesburg, obviously. Um, Moscow problematic, Brasilia likewise. And these are quite large distances. These are out, you know, 20, uh, 20, so 26 kilometers from the center. Uh, so th these are cities where urban form, you know, seems that the relationship between these three objects, the residential, the jobs, the infrastructure, does not seem to be uh, hanging together very well. This is terribly preliminary stuff that uh, a couple of people that just started work a few weeks ago on the project gave me. Uh, Dar es Salaam, sort of similar charts um, for, for Dar es Salaam. There's sort of conjecture that um, African cities really aren't very dense, they're, they're, they're rather sprawling. I guess there are three things, and it's, it's hard to read the scales on these things, but if you stare at them hard enough and persuade yourself of what you want to be persuaded of, uh, you come out with three, three messages from here. First, these African cities aren't very dense, right? The vertical axis, this is sort of Paris and Warsaw. Surely not, Sh Shanghai was a thousand on that axis in the center, right? So these are not dense, dense cities. That's point one. They seem to have a sort of flat area, right? So they've got, you know, they, they, they've got a center, but then they've got a large sort of flat area and then taking off. But also quite a lot of the population mass. And remember, as you go further out, the rings are getting bigger areas. So in terms of population mass, quite a lot of population mass yeah, sort of more than 10 kilometers out, particularly as uh, Dar es Salaam has grown. So, early days, I said I wasn't giving research results, but the sort of suggestion that African cities are not dense, they're sort of rather, they're relatively flat, and you know, in the case of Dar es Salaam, a lot going on a long way out. Nairobi, the data is really difficult. I mean, the population estimates for Kabira vary from 150,000 to a million or something. So, so real, real uh, da data problems. But again, you know, this is 10 kilometers out, um, 10 kilometers out, so not conforming to that nice uh, gradient. Okay, so I've talked a little bit, a bit about you know, monocentric model, urban form, notions of density. Let me now talk about each of the three component parts, some of the sort of economic issues that arise in thinking about those component parts, um, and then try and put it together. Okay, residential stuff. Uh, the residential ingredient. Okay, obviously really important. Um, you know, in 
intrinsically, above all, for livability, well-being, you know, the, the well-being of people in cities uh, depends on the quality of the place uh, that they're living in, for themselves, for their families, and for attracting and holding a, a labor force for the city. So the intrinsic value of, of well-being. Access to employment, amenities, and all that, you don't want to be out into the way, so that's for sure. Right? Uh, the location matters for that. The housing stock also matters for other sort of more macroeconomic reasons, if you like. Um, yeah, most of us hold a very large proportion of our wealth uh, in housing. Uh, the UK, a third of national wealth is uh, residential structures. So it's an enormously important asset uh, for individuals and the economy as a whole. And potentially a fantastic source of employment, you know, building cities. Um, if you look at the history of cities like Melbourne, some of these um, you know, fast-growing resource boom cities, for a long time, what the city was doing was building the city. It was, that was what, that's what the jobs were in the city. It was, it was building itself. So it was employment as well. So housing patterns for all sorts of reasons. I hope that's, I'm sure that's obvious. But let's think about what it takes for it to work, for actually to have a system that delivers um, you know, fairly high density, acceptable quality housing. And I'm going to be focusing on private housing. Clearly, there's sort of public housing issues that I don't have enough time uh, to, to, to get involved in. What does it take? Well, let, let me give you five things that I think, then think it takes. Um, one, you need decent property rights. Now, you know, we can debate what sort of property rights are good enough uh, for, for particular things. But if you're actually talking about you know, capital investment in you know, tall, long-lived structures, you probably need pretty good property rights. <laughs> Uh, to, make, to, to have the security uh, to make those sorts of long-term investments. And obviously we know that lots of, lots of developing country cities, African cities, property rights uh, are, are not always perfectly clear. I mean, they, they you know, maybe had traditional forms of ownership, then were privatized, but sort of not necessarily clarified, uh, competing, competing claims in perfect registration processes. So lots of obstacles to um, making the capital investments at all. But bad property rights have other sort of negative implications as well. You know, if you want to consolidate blocks of land, you know, to make a factory space or do a large housing development, that consolidation uh, issue uh, get, 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 gets very difficult to do. If you want to run a property tax, you probably need to know who, who uh, has title uh, to the land. If you want property to be collateral, So lots of reasons um, why, why property rights matter. And then also other issues to do with rental markets that I, 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 I won't mention. So what do we need to make, make the residential sector work? You need to, you know, good, good enough, possibly quite good uh, property rights. You need, excuse me, you need finance. Uh, you need to have a financial intermediation system that will enable people to borrow to, uh, uh, to construct uh, or buy houses. Uh, we know, you know across the world that the you know, mainstream commercial banks don't seem to be very good at delivering that. Uh, maybe transaction costs or something, but it seems like you need special, uh, specialized mortgage finance institutions uh, to develop um, as, as, as they did in Germany about 140 years ago or whatever, 150 years ago. Um, so you need that financial interme intermediation, but in many countries it's missing Commercial banks aren't willing to lend. Inflation makes things difficult, of course, uh, if you're paying it on nominal interest, well, it's a nominal interest rate plus repayment of 25% of the value of the loan or something, then uh, there's you know, clearly, clearly an obstacle. Government intervention in that market hasn't always worked. So you need property rights, you need financial intermediation. You need infrastructure. And I want to talk about city-wide infrastructure later, but let me say a couple of things about local infrastructure. You know, just for the residential side, you, want, you do need to have a street laid out. And then there are increasing returns to scale, to putting in water supply, sewerage, things like that. So there's that sort of local infrastructure. And maybe that can be provided by the private sector. In, in, in London, historically, land was sold off for development in quite large parcels, and the developer put that stuff in, um, the, the, the local infrastructure. But maybe it's not by the private sector or the public sector, in which case that's, that's another obstacle, right? You, you, you've got a problem. Another thing you need uh, 
the residential sector to work, uh, build, build, building regulations that, that, that are appropriate. You need building regulations, right? If you're going to have a second-hand um, market, a market in, in, in used houses, you know, people really do like to know that the foundations are there without having to dig down and check themselves. So you do want you know, building regulations uh, for, for those reasons of imperfect information and you know, other, other reasons I've, I've put there. But of course, in many countries, building regulations have simply been too tight. So they've been circumvented. Uh, you have you know, formal sector housing, but uh, elite housing that uh, on, on large plots that uh, is in line with the building regulations and then are bifurcated you know, and, and another sector where there's regulations as it's in the executive order. Let me not talk about that because I don't bother. I think I'm, I'm not quite running out of time but going too slowly. And then you need a construction sector that can deliver the, the, the deliver uh, housing. And again, in a lot of countries that construction sector is rather absent. Now maybe that's endogenous to the thing that I was just talking about. But if material costs are really high, if you know, one man has the monopoly of uh, cement, he may end up the richest man in Africa, but it's not going to do much to help the uh, uh, construction uh, industry get going. Um, so also, also problems there, you obviously need that sector. So what I've done here is saying, one what, what of these ingredients, uh, one of the components, housing, there's a whole set of necessary conditions, uh, those things I've run through. If they're missing, then well, what do we observe? We see one, we, we, we see housing markets where you know, formal mass housing, what we might think is the largest part of the, the market, isn't there. It's absent, right? There's, there's shanty stuff, there's elite stuff, and there's very little in between. So a whole list of sort of you know, uh, issues, policy things uh, that need to, be, need to be addressed there. Okay. My three components. Residential, we want it to be nice and dense and getting tall and, and all that, but lots of reasons why that doesn't seem to be working. What about the production side? Let's turn to that. Um, yeah, my, my little diagram, it was just a straight line, right? But what actually determines urban productivity? Well, the standard story, which I believe, uh, you know, important mechanisms, is that the concentration of economic activity in space uh, yields high productivity. That's why cities exist. Economic and social reaction, interactions work better when things are close together. The usual list of you know, mechanisms dating back to Alfred Marshall, whatever. Large markets, thinking economies of scale, thick labor markets. You know, think about London. If you, you can get a specialist in anything you like uh, in London, and it's worthwhile for that person to have trained as a specialist in whatever you like, because it's a big market, right? So development of these real specialist skills takes a big, thick urban labor market. Uh, networks form, uh, people in networks talk to each other. Uh, what is it? We can only, the, the, all our networks are constrained by some number of people we can hold in our brains. I forget the number. Um, but the point is, if you're in a village, we all know the same people, whatever it is. Uh, if we're in a city, we all know different 140 people. So the knowledge is flowing around uh, far, far, far more. And of course, simple economies of scale uh, in the provision of power, utilities, and so on. So mechanisms, uh, the evidence, uh, the sort of stylized facts that float around is that doubling city size in the cross section raises productivity by you know, three to eight percent, maybe, maybe more. And that's a huge number, because as you go from 100,000 to two to four to eight, you, you, you're doubling many, many times. So these are enormous productivity uh, increases uh, that are going on. And there are cities where innovation tends to take place, uh, and tricky empirical questions about whether the productivity effects are city-wide or within particular sectors of electronics or whatever uh, take place, uh, basically. Is that a whoops? Ah, right. Okay. Um, let's think about the implications of that. So productivity isn't a straight line. It's something that's increasing with city size. 
I have obviously picked this diagram, so there are lots of multiple intersections and things. But my, my, my wage, urban wage line, is now uh, sort of increasing and concave. Two implications. Growing the city raises productivity. Okay, moving out to the right, you increase productivity. So if you do the transport improvement, it makes the city bigger. In London, if you do Crossrail, it gets all these valuable bankers into the city of London. That's going to raise everyone's productivity. Okay? That was part of the rationale for doing, doing Crossrail. Um, that's one implication. The other implication, well, there's that there are multiple equilibria here. Um, you know, you're stuck here, right? You haven't got your city going, so productivity is rather low. The point, but if you're here, you've got the city going, your productivity is really high. The point being, of course, it makes it very hard to start new cities. There's coordination failure, right? You know, who is going to go um, to reap the agglomeration ben benefits of a new city when they're the only person there and there are no agglomeration benefits. So an important point there about being hard to start new cities. Is that a, the whole story for developing countries? That's the sort of textbook thing I've given you. How do we need to modify that if we think about developing countries? So let me do a slightly, there's also sort of analytical extension here. If I've got seven or eight minutes, I will. Okay? Seven or eight. You've already heard this morning, I mean, Adam talking about his, 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 his work. When, when we think about these cities, it's really useful to distinguish between tradable activities and non-tradable activities. The tradable, yeah, so think of you know, Shanghai or, or whatever, doing export-oriented activities, exports really out of the region, out of the country, whatever, manufacturers, right? Yeah, there you've got the increasing returns model uh, that I sketched, those productivity but of course, we know that most people in developing country cities aren't employed in those sorts of activities. They're employed in government, local services, retail, construction, and the informal sector, delivering uh, informal sector services. Now, of course, you've got to ask, where does the demand, you know, where does the income come from to generate the demand for the non-tradable services? Well, it comes from government, tax revenues going to the capital city, it comes from resource revenues, um, maybe it comes from a sort of entrepot trade. Um, you know, there's also uh, commodities are sort of passing through the city uh, in, into the hinterland. Into the hinterland. Um, and it also comes from the workers themselves. So you can't bootstrap it entirely on that argument. Obviously, there has to be some external injection of funds. Maybe there are increasing returns to the tradable stuff, but there are probably decreasing returns to non-tradables. Not so much because the technology is necessarily decreasing returns, just because you've got this, these sort of lumps of demand, rather inelastic demand, and when you increase supply, the price is going to go down, so the returns go down. Okay? So what I'm, I'm skipping a slide. So what I want to give you is, I think, the last of these pictures, which is saying, well, let's, let's if, if you buy what I've just said, then that urban wage curve, you see we've got two bits on it. There's the non-tradable stuff. Well given the resource revenues and stuff coming into the city, there are diminishing returns. So you're going to see more larger informal sector, the price of this stuff is going down, and the city is getting diminishing returns. Okay, so there's this. But there's also um, the tradable sector that is increasing returns. Trust me, it fits together. But of course, we're in multiple equilibrium land again, okay? So if you really, you know, suppose you commute across the town, you might be stuck there, right? That's the African city that, uh, you know, isn't actually that big. Um, it's doing this non-tradable stuff. Um, it's quite high, it's quite a high cost, high wage city because workers are all employed doing this non-tradable stuff. And it's too high cost to attract the tradable. This is the Shanghai, this is the Dalai Lama, it's stuck in the low level track um, doing the non tradable stuff. And because of the commuting costs, all those city costs, then you're too expensive a city to actually get into the tradable, tradable activities. So I want you to piece.
piece these sort of bits together in your, in, in, in your mind, those two component parts. So when you think about you know, the standard theory, put in some sort of non-tradables, resource revenues, whatever, being spent, some diminishing returns, then we, then we do get the story of urbanization without industrialization. Cities potentially getting locked uh, in that, that, that sort of low equilibrium. selling stuff to each other, doing the non-tradable stuff, rather than breaking into tradables. Okay, policy implications on that. When you want to create locations that are productive, you want to you know, do the shift from A to B, how do you do it? Transport, okay. Um, central area transport in particular, you want to get density, right? If you do transport right through the city, you're going to put workers way out. You want the central area transport you want all the usual stuff to improve uh, the business environment. There's an additional problem, that where that, um, this bit, there's an additional problem. If you think of these African cities sort of evolving as, you know, just doing the non-tradables, the local stuff, rather than the global, well, maybe the local non-tradable stuff is actually not that concentrated in the central business district, it's dispersed. But if it's dispersed, the rent gradients will be rather flat. So the city will have built itself in a very undense way. And then if you try to put an activity in the city that requires density and the nice rent gradients, you've got all this historical capital stock, residential stock, that just doesn't fit. It, 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 it's wrong. Okay? So real, real prospects, I would think, of being sort of stuck down there. So African cities evolving as, as local rather than global. Okay, that's some analytical frameworks, and some of the issues on the residential side, the production side. Yeah, we all believe cities are places with increasing returns, but we look at African cities and we see a lot of the non-traded stuff and the, a trap that I've tried to sort of capture uh, in, in simple ways there. Two words on infrastructure, uh, and I'm concluding. The residential side, business side, the infrastructure side. There are really just two remarks uh, I want to make on infrastructure, one on finance and one on um, choosing infrastructure. <coughs> Financing infrastructure is obviously a huge topical problem. Uh, I'm not going to do well, more than make, make one point. You've already seen that the gains from city productivity get transferred rents, right, my very first little chart, right, the gains get transferred to rent, they get capitalized in land values. So for financing infrastructure, cities have the perfect tax base, which is land. It's fair, right, as you grow the city, land values go up, you know, why should the income from landowners get up? No reason whatsoever, I don't know right, it's fair, uh, it's efficient, it's a tax on pure economic surplus, so it won't distort any, uh, decision taking. And furthermore, we know that that tax base is large enough to finance all the infrastructure that you want to build. We know that by a very simple direct argument. You only want to build the infrastructure if the benefit, which is measured by the rent, right, my original diagram, is greater than the cost. So the rent has to be at least enough to pay for the infrastructure. So it's the perfect tax base in theory, but we know in implementation lots of issues. You know, economy and other, other, other issues as well. Final point on infrastructure, then I'll, then I'll move to wrapping up. It's easy to say, you know, infrastructure is good, important, do it. Uh, but of course, the, uh, it's a rather thorny question of what you do. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to give anything like a uh, comprehensive answer, but a couple of remarks. Let's think through the benefits of, let's say, transport intra-urban transport uh, improvement in this sort of world. Well, what do the cost-benefit analysts do? Well, they look at the direct cost saving from you know, energy and time, fine, easy. They look at traffic created and benefits from that, easy. In Britain, they look at wider benefits. They say, well, maybe you are growing the city of London, you're growing an agglomeration, 
let's add in some of these agglomeration, urban agglomeration effects, right? So we actually do that. It's standard in North America, so that's always fun. But when, when you think about growing cities, there's another role that infrastructure is playing, which is shaping the entire city. Right? We know the city is growing, but where do I put my office block? Where do I put my house? Depends what I think the future shape of the city is going to be. So infrastructure obviously can play a coordinating role, uh, coordinating expectations. You know, well, we're going to put a road here. So if you're thinking about doing a, building an office, you better put it there, and the other guy will put it there, and you're growing the, the, the cluster, the productivity stuff. So infrastructure is potentially playing that, that really important role. But of course, it's only going to do that if it leads, not lags. Right? <laughs> if it's doing it after everything has been built, if you're retrofitting, um, then that role is just gone out of the window, obviously. Okay? So there's an important role there that I think we need to think about more, and we need to get evidence on. Let me try and sort of fold this together by, remember I said at the beginning, three elements, but also these coordinating mechanisms as well. Markets, yeah, um, fundamentally important allocating land, but there are public goods and externalities and market interventions. Infrastructure, the sorts of arguments uh, I made a moment ago, yeah, really important public provision, and this difficult one about shaping, uh, coordinating city growth. Uh, regulation. At the micro level, all the building regulations, but also, of course, regulation can be used to shape the city, you know, city plans, city vision, uh, that sort of coordinating of expectations uh, mechanism can be played by city plans uh, at one point or another. And the very final point, um, one hesitates to talk about sort of new cities. I should have actually, I shouldn't have put new cities, I should have put growing secondary cities. Um, but if Africa's urban population Clearly, we have to think about um, doing the satellite cities or the new cities or whatever. It's it. It's hard for that quantitative reason, that's the sheer scale of the, 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 the issue, and partly that it's about retrofitting. If, if, if you buy my argument that African, that a lot of these cities are not dense enough, they've evolved for a different sort of economy, then retrofitting may not be a cost effective way of doing it. Um, okay. Excellent introduction framework setting um, that I think all of us profited a lot. I would like to now call uh, Professor Mahmoud. He is the country advisor at IGC Bangladesh, okay. and he's a professor of economics at the University of Dhaka. Please. It is difficult to comment on uh, Tony's uh, presentation because he's an expert on. Uh, I think the uh, only credential I can claim for commenting on this excellent presentation is that I uh, live in Dhaka. And uh, you know that Economist Intelligence Unit, which uh, creates um, publishes an index of livability, and it has um, made a habit of uh, designating Dhaka every year as um, either the worst or the second worst livable city in the world among all 140 cities they have considered. So um, finding uh, ways of solving Dhaka's problem is a test case for uh, Tony and also for IGC because IGC has uh, chosen city as one of its focus area of research. But um, having said that, consider also the fact that uh, Dhaka has been, um, I think along with uh, Lagos in Nigeria, has been the fastest growing cities uh, in last 30 years. And uh, also uh, consider with that the fact that uh, Bangladesh is Performance, Bangladesh's growth performance, uh, 
Bangladesh is uh, among the 25 largest developing countries in terms of size of GDP, PPP adjusted. And in, in among those 25 countries, Bangladesh is among the top 10 fastest growing countries in GDP by the terms during the last uh, 22 decades. Uh, which, uh, and, and, and it has been estimated that Dhaka's contribution to that incremental GDP growth has been at least half. So it, it conforms uh, to the, uh, one of the stylized facts of economic growth, which Tony stressed, uh, that uh, economic growth is associated with urbanization, no matter how uh, unlivable uh, those, uh, how livable those urban areas are. Let me here uh, draw a distinction between the contribution of cities to economic growth, which Tony was discussing about the productivity of cities, and uh, the way, uh, say, economic intelligence, economist intelligence unit grades cities according to livability index, well, which of course uh, um, considers not only productivity, but uh, economic aspects, but also quality of living in terms of health care, education, and other things. And uh, so that maybe uh, efficient or productive growth promoting cities and uh, most livable cities are not necessarily the exactly the same thing. I can see here the subtle difference uh, uh, in the economic literature between pure economic growth and growth with human development, which, which are related, but they, they uh, have uh, um, different aspects in them. Having said that, um, let me raise some uh, research questions, because this is a session about um, raising uh, research issues, um, from which may, um, may sound a bit naive, uh, because I'm not really an expert on the economics of city development. Uh, first, uh, cities, whether in developing countries or in rich countries, have uh, more income inequality than in rural areas. Now, in um, low-income countries, of course, uh, the um, average Income of dwellers, income dwellers, uh, will be relatively low, even if you hire them rural average. So that creates, since um, there is increasing urbanization, it creates the problem of urban poverty, and related to that, the poverty of uh, slum dwellers and things, which are part of problems of urbanization, including um, uh, living standards and environmental problems and so on, and growth of slums. Second, uh, as uh, Tony was saying, that cities have advantage of conglomeration of activities, which are the economies of scale, um, where he said that uh, two equilibrium is where the start of the city has, has a problem, but once the city is growing, then it has an agglomeration problem. But there is another, another uh, outside equilibrium, which is that uh, agglomeration uh, advantage is there, but uh, if there is uh, too much congestion, say you take more time to transport and things, then there are these economies of congestion. So what the forcing a tipping point of where the advantage of conglomeration will be uh, counteracted by disadvantage or disadvantage of, disadvantage of congestion uh, is, is important because um, once cities grows, there is some irreversibility in terms of uh, sunk cost in the structure and, um, uh, and, 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 and other things. So, um, for example, one can uh, cannot redo 
things, if, if one could redo things, then take care of my, my city of Dhaka. There are thousands of ready-made garment factories uh, are located in Dhaka, uh, near Dhaka. Whereas, um, uh, uh, according to one World Bank survey in 2005, prime price of land in prime areas of Dhaka is surpassed only by price in San Diego, not even in London, not even in Tokyo. Why is it so? Because of extreme land scarcity in the country in Bangladesh. And it creates other problems that if you, you happen to have or inherit some um, land in Dhaka city, then you become rich by global standard. And it creates a problem of uh, capital transfer as well. Even Remittance is coming to Bangladesh. There is a illegal market for um, for uh, foreign exchange, and one can transfer money abroad and buy a house in London rather than in Dhaka. So there are problems here of um, tax policies of how to keep land prices under control. Third. There is a basic question. Can low-income countries afford a mega city? Uh, UN statistics show that uh, already Dhaka city is the 11th largest city in the world. And among the la largest 10 cities, only two cities in, uh, in um, Japan and one city having and New York combined are those three cities are among the largest 10 cities. And in future, large, largest cities will be all in developing countries, in low income countries. Uh, so I, I ask this question can a low income country afford a mega city? Is because if the per capita income of city dwellers are not sufficiently high, can they pay for the urban services uh, uh, which has to be subsidized to a large extent? Now, large countries like uh, India and China can pool resources to subsidize uh, those sort of facilities in some of the big cities. But can uh, a smaller countries like Dhaka pool that resources to subsidize those sort of uh, facilities. Fourth, um, about uh, decentralized urbanization. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's an infrastructure strategy which dictate whether how urbanization will take place. Whether um, a, a countries like um, one mega city country like uh, Bangkok in Thailand whether urbanization will spread along the peripheries of that one city or there will be separate uh, entities of small or cities or townships. On that will depend on what sort of uh, infrastructural strategies uh, will promote that sort of um, decentralized um, uh, industrialization. And it also will depend on whether those uh, smaller cities are created to disperse uh, industrialization or to serve the hinterland agriculture. So it will depend on the nature of the uh, economies involved. And uh, Tony uh, uh, discussed about uh, bicycle There is a political economy aspects in this also. Uh, say in Dhaka city, <laughs> most of the mm, mm, urban trips in terms of miles in a day is done by pedestrians. Uh, 
Although uh, all the city, city planning is geared towards facilitating movements of cars, not even mass transport. So there is a political economy aspects here which should be taken into account. And uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, I think I have, uh, I have raised several questions. I do not know whether these questions are according to ascending or descending order of difficulty and complexity. <laughs> But lastly, um, let me um, congratulate IGC that they uh, have chosen cities as one of the four focus research areas. Uh, this is because um, the problem of cities has been traditionally uh, the domain of uh, what I call urban or city planners and architects. Although it is a multidisciplinary topics and a topic so far is largely neglected in development economics and uh, if IDC can redress this imbalance that is a great achievement. Thank you very much. Well, those were very thoughtful comments. Um, I would like to call now uh, Professor Nava Shrap. She is an associate professor, as I said, at Harvard Business School. She is also um, working in Zambia uh, as one of our legal advisors. We need to call this. So. essentially what is just a research agenda at this point, a uh, kind of um, launching of several ideas under an umbrella. And it's been wonderful to hear my colleagues um, speaking here because a lot of these ideas actually um, are linked to some, a lot of what's been brought up in the panel. And so um, it would be great to use this as, a, as a, a, a way to exchange kind of thinking about how we really launch research in this area. Um, this, uh, this is a joint research agenda with the government of Zambia, IGC Zambia, and, um, and Ed Glazer. Um, <clears throat> Ed Glazer, as many of you know, are, is one of the leading urban economists, and some of what I'll present in terms of the framework here um, is drawn directly from his work over the years, as well as his really excellent book on um, the trials and triumphs of the city. And he was recently in Zambia for um, six days, and I'll tell you about that visit and what came out of that visit. Um, he is going to actually present a lot more of the framework in terms of urbanization, and in particular, this idea of daemons of density tomorrow at the Zambia session s through videos. So if you'd like to hear him present it or, and or get involved with the research, which we really encourage, I, especially as the lead academic for Zambia, would really love to encourage you to be part of this research umbrella, please do come tomorrow. Um, we use the term daemons, which is a Latinized version of the Greek word on godlike power. And it's really the idea that there are good and bad angels that come from density, um, as we've heard. <laughs> and, uh, and so much of the work of cities is to reduce uh, the, the bad parts and, and improve the good parts. So, um, uh, um, I, uh, I just uh, started as lead academic. I'm not an urban economist, so I will say that up front as an urban development economist who realized that much of my work was happening in the urban and peri-urban areas in Lusaka and could not help but notice the extraordinary transformation 
that to happen. And this is just an aerial picture of Lusaka in 1981 and Lusaka in 2009. And you see the degree of, of density and development that has occurred. Um, Lusaka is also one of the fastest growing cities in the world and in, in, in many ways is um, representing uh, some of what's happening across Africa. The opportunity that I, we have in Zambia is that the government is um, very deliberately thinking ahead to think, how do we take advantage of this growth? How do we um, actually design it from the beginning? So some of what Professor Venables was talking about in terms of these secondary cities, um, how do we make it right from the beginning? Um, and, uh, and just to sort of say, so the, the initial idea of this was uh, working with the government to think, how do we build the innovative and inclusive Lusaka of the future? Um, that works with the sort of, the, the government is in the process of developing an, a national urban plan with the underlying idea that, as we've heard, you know, cities are the absence of physical space between people. They ease connection, but they enable contagion. And of course now we think of the contagion as a bad thing, but, you know, contagion can also be a fantastic thing. You know, over millennia, contagion has been the spread of ideas and the density that, that facilitates that. Um, of course there's also bad contagion, so this is, uh, I mean, this, this is from uh, the Agora in, in East End, the spread of ideas there. It's very famous um, painting. But this is um, the, the degree of pestilence in New York City. Um, and for years, New York City uh, was, was one of the places in which you had the, the highest uh, mortality rates in the U.S., and now it's lower than average. So how did that happen? And how do you, um, and in growing density, reduce the bad contagion and encourage the good contagion? Um, so before I sort of talk about the research ideas that are underneath that, that umbrella of reducing bad contagion and encouraging good contagion, I want to say a word about the process that we used to come up with the research ideas that would both be relevant for policy and would be kind of at the frontier scientifically and would be interesting um, in terms of building the, the research agenda on cities. Um, and what we did was to, so actually I'll say this, it was a, you know, six-day core effort led with the, the IGC Zambia team, um, but this was as a result of significant preparation that had been done by IGC in terms of developing what, what are the real priorities of the government. And then um, I also went there and we brought, Ed and I brought two of our best PhD students from Harvard, um, Bryce and Alex Steinberg and, um, and Abraham Holland, to be there for several weeks um, with us while the ideas were developing and to follow up. Um, and there was significant follow-up. The in the, within the, just the core week, we met with 50 officials, and um, we identified 11 project ideas, which I'm going to present to you very briefly in an overview way. Um, and what we were looking for was ideas where there was going to be high academic value that would sort of overlap, which sometimes people don't think exist, but really, I mean, I think as a result of talking and understanding what the key questions are, you can find this overlap between um, high academic value and high policy relevance. And the question I, we, we would ask in every meeting is, what are the key questions that you're facing as a policymaker where research could serve the needs of the country and fit with the na national urban plan? So this is from the document making an argument for why Zambia needs a national urban plan. And this was, again, with this, this idea that Professor Venables was talking about in terms of um, developing, you know, the coordinating idea of a vision and how important that can be. So, you know, they write, by ensuring density, diversity, and innovation, cities can boost economic activities. And then there's a whole lot, and we'll talk about this a little bit, there's a lot around industrial clusters, for example, and other ways in terms of encouraging innovation in, in cities. And then a national urban plan for Zambia can support poverty reduction, spatial planning, land management, housing, basic and social services, infrastructural development, and coordination of law, the large-scale investments. And our objective is to launch this research agenda now, which we're sort of doing and in the, the three core ideas that I'll, I'll um, talk through, as well as encourage as much of this facilitation so that within these 18 months we can have these inputs that would be part of, we're working closely with the people who are um, designing this national urban plan so that it can become part of the, the government's vision and, and growth in this area. And the, uh, yeah, so this is, these are, let me sort of get to the core ideas. Um, the first one is, is just drawn from something that, I'll tell you again, I had thought initially um, was, was terribly boring, which is water and sanitation. But of course, this is probably the, the most, I mean, it, okay. 
one of the most, if not the most important role that the government can play in creating a productive city. Um, and uh, Zambia is no exception. Uh, billions of dollars have been invested in the city of Lusaka for building infrastructure in water. Um, there's a big challenge, which is that this infrastructure has been built in several of the compounds, urban compounds, which is which have been uh, suffered tremendously from. I mean, this is this is water connections that allow you to have flush toilets, for example. They 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 incur, you know facilitate both um, clean water and sanitation. Um, and, uh, and the challenge is that it is very difficult and costly to have households connect to the main line. Um, and this could be for many reasons. And we first started by looking and see this, this, this sort of second core idea is just what is the incentive for these households to connect. And you know, there had been a lot in the press about these um, white elephant projects that were you know, billions of dollars in investment, and yet actually the, oh, the, the benefits to the city and to the individuals only come when people can actually connect to the main line. If they're not connecting to the main line, how are we going to see the benefits of this, of this investment? Um, and, uh, and so we've been working with the Millennium Challenge account, who's, who's um, helping to, to launch the infrastructure, to think about the best paths. They, they've been already thinking about it a lot. Um, and, uh, and, and to think about this sort of very clear last mile problem. But then it raises another question. So these were lots of conversations that we were having over that week. But it raised another question, which was, um, given the billions of dollars of investment, why didn't they just also subsidize that last connection? Because a big part, when you're looking at this, this isn't just behavioral economics. You know, there's actually, it's quite expensive to connect to the main line. Why wouldn't you actually connect to the main line? And, um, and, and, uh, and why wouldn't that be subsidized? So what we learned is that there's, there's been a big policy debate around the role of subsidizing these household connections with the underlying principle that if households don't pay for something, they're not going to value it. And, and of course, there's actually been research, um, some of my research from seven years ago in Zambia suggests that actually that's not necessarily the case um, with, with other types of health products. A lot of um, our colleagues have done work in this area, but there was a very clear kind of uh, argument from the government that we cannot allow subsidies because this is going to change the valuation of um, the connection is going to, we need them to shift their behavior, they're not going to be willing to do that. And even though as economists and people in the Ministry of Finance, for example, understand the value of externalities and how this is, this is causing a tremendous externality, it's not something that um, people really didn't see it differently from the lobbying that would happen in sub for subsidies for maize, for example. So it became clear that what was really needed was a very, very careful study of the private and social benefits that come from water connection. In other words, to really measure what is a private uh, benefit that comes from that and how much is there social externality that arises from that so that we can sort of make the argument for, um, for investment in that way. And, and that's actually provided a really incredible uh, opportunity for us to map all of Lusaka in terms of all the topography and the pipage across the whole city and to use as an instrument pipe breakages, which are not always um, quickly fixed by the, by the, the water authorities, um, as an instrument to identify the effect of being connected to the main. And we've mapped that, geocoded that, with, um, matched it with education data, business development data, and health data to really be able to measure these externalities, social externalities on people who are connected to those who are connected to the main. Um, the second core idea, so that's on reducing bad contagion. The um, other part in terms of encouraging good contagion, these are, these are um, pictures from the, the trip. Um, and this is, um, this is us in, uh, these two members of Life Zambia team, um, Alan Kirchhoff, the executive director here, Paul Lupo, um, senior advisor, <coughs> some of the PhD students and others. This is, um, this is uh, one of the extraordinary compounds in Kundere in Zambia, um, where uh, the government has focused a lot of investment in industrial clusters. So they brought people together who were doing manufacturing, these guys are um, making vapes and green furniture. Um, and it was extraordinary to talk to them because what they said is that in fact they were, 
and we're that far from each other because in these industrial clusters, some of them are coming out of the air, but some of them are just basically formalizing something that was already happening in the city. And so they're just sort of making it easier for people to talk to each other, bring them together, for example, for trainings on credit that they get to be able to grow their businesses. Um, and, and they would say that the way that they started to talk to each other about, for example, marketing opportunities. And they understood a lot more, and even though they were, you know, not that far from each other, but just far enough that they hadn't shared these ideas. And so uh, that sort of started us thinking, how do we measure the impacts of this type of um, bringing people together to share ideas about business development? On, you know, moving people, for example, from these microenterprises to small-scale enterprises, to medium-sized enterprises. And, um, but one of the things that they had most trouble with was on financial skills and business skills um, development. So that's the area that we've been focusing on, which is to, and the idea that we have is basically to seed, to seed an idea into the cluster, to map out its spread in terms of its good contagion, and then to look at its impact. And, um, and we've been working with um, a wonderful private and public sector kind of um, organization and firm who's been uh, won awards in the last year over being the best mobile banking um, uh, organization in Africa, uh, who is launching a new product which is essentially a banking instrument. And um, we're going to randomize it across, across um, the compounds in the Sahel and then look at its spread, um, in particular looking at the importance of geographical density versus social density and uh, hopefully also industrial density. Um, we also, these are the areas that we as a research team are undertaking. Um, and again, as a, as a, these are very, very early stages. Um, and we also identified eight other core research ideas that could be interesting for others um, to implement and, and look at. And we are going to put this, I think, into the call for proposals in IGES Zambia. But it was great to hear some of these things. So some of these are very uh, similar. So you'll see um, there is uh, exploring possibilities for experimental tolls with the Zambia Road Authority. Um, there was a, so a wonderful outtake of this um, trip was that there was a lot of conversations on things that didn't turn into research but were helpful in terms of the, the role of um, just the basic idea that I didn't even fully kind of grasp that building more roads is not going to um, take traffic off the streets, it's going to just bring more, more cars to the roads. It's a very basic idea, but it led to a lot of conversations around, okay, what could we actually do in terms of congestion pricing? And, um, and uh, there's a number of other possibilities in terms of, um, um, for example, providing resettled individuals who move with payments over time or vouchers rather than a single lump sum for a house, which is what they're given. Each one of these is, um, has a government organization, an agency that is associated with it and is willing to actually think about randomization, for example, is willing to think about um, really collaborating on the research ideas. Um, one of the things that they most kind of was interested in, I realize it's not on here, um, was about, yes, it is here, about using land rather than property taxes. So that also was a conversation that we thought about and that they wanted to think about this is the ministry of local government um, potentially implementing in a, in a experimental or trial way. Um, and uh, and we'll, we can talk more through these in the, in the session um, tomorrow. But the idea is to cultivate a kind of umbrella of, um, of research projects. Okay, maybe we'll talk about them now. So let me, actually, I'll say a couple words on, on this, which is, um, for example, the National Construction Council was very interested in looking at, they switched to electronic permitting and um, they want to see whether it reduced bribery and corruption. Um, and they are willing to share all the data and have people come and, uh, and, and look at that. Um, there's a challenge of the kind of payment structure of water infrastructure and, um, and an interest in looking at the cross-subsidization of water rates and to what extent that's not allowing a lot of, of the organizations that provide the water to, to go into low-income communities. Um, uh, the National Construction Council has been doing um, a lot of interesting training for construction workers and for construction companies in business training. They're willing to randomize it. So anyone who wants to work with them, that is an open area. Um, 
one of the things we noticed in the compound study was that the extraordinary importance of these uh, local development committees and the ones who allow, who basically can determine how much they're able to go after the resources that could be available for them to develop the compounds. But they are currently volunteers. They're not professionalized. And, um, and they can often be um, uh, appropriated by political interest. So uh, there's a question there of what can be done to recruit and select the best types of people to, um, to become part of these development committees. Um, we've been working with the Ministry of Education actually for the last four or five years. They're now very interested in improving teacher quality, providing feedback, and that's a, another area of, of great interest. Um, and uh, and the, the general uh, area of civil service reform is, is an open area in Zambia, and one in which there's lots of people who are interested in, in uh, shaping it. So again, um, each of these, the idea was to come up with research questions that we think from an economics literacy perspective would kind of be quite interesting, and where there's a real openness <coughs> as part of the government agencies to collaborate from the beginning, really in a prospective design to think about this and then to have the results come into um, into policy. But I think that, and that's with this thinking of Lusaka as a learning city, with research studies and experiments going on in different parts of the city and building towards that. But what we also like to do is create this sort of umbrella where we can all learn from each other as well. So just as much as the density helps to uh, spread ideas within a city, we would like to create an environment where the, all the researchers who are working in this area can um, uh, allow the spread of ideas to be as, as, as fruitful as possible. And so we're just at the very early stages of this and welcome all input and feedback on this. Well, we have close to 20 minutes still for Q&A. So uh, who would like to start with it? Maybe the mic over there. Um, questions? Uh, this is, uh, in some sense, a side comment, but the, the presentations have focused on single cities, uh, typically with a focus on the capital city by the names put up and by the biggest city in the country, again, by the names put up. Um, you know, we are worried also about urbanization throughout the, the country. The primate city, uh, which is often the capital city, usually has 25 to 50 percent of the urban population in a medium-sized developing country, um, but that still leaves a lot of action out there in the, the rest of the urban system. And um, typically, the smallest in uh, cities and medium-sized cities, and not necessarily typically, but often they're faster growing than the capital city, partly because the capital city is not necessarily that well managed and maybe uh, congested. And understanding that process is, is also important and our focus of energies is often on reforms in the capital city or the primate city and less on the secondary cities which in fact house uh, the majority of the urban population. And so we do need to be aware of, of thinking about the rest of cities, uh, their infrastructure and uh, institutional development. and particularly in the case of Africa, if on the growth path um, for many of these countries to really push to median income levels, uh, some degree of industrialization has got to happen. That is going to happen in, and be competitive on world markets. In the end, that's going to be occurring in these secondary cities. I mean, primate cities, huge cities are really not as competitive for standardized export-oriented manufacturing. Um, it's more the secondary cities, especially, for example, if you look at China and how that's evolved over the last uh, 30 years. Um, and that then says that if this is going to work in these secondary cities, you need to be worried uh, about both their internal structure as well as their links to, uh, to ports and uh, into a national transport network. So that was my comment. Thank you very much. Very useful comment, Professor Henderson. Uh, questions, comments? 
and observations. Uh, Professor Venerables, um, in your framework for uh, developing country cities, what do you think the impact of being a coastal city as opposed to a landlocked city would have on that framework? Yeah, I, I, I think I think coastal is is actually really important. Um, you know, you, you have to ask what are these cities going to be doing, um, and I think yeah, a lot of the high productivity jobs that we hope to see uh, come to Africa are going to be in manufacturers, as, as wages rise in China and through the rest of Asia, so an opportunity opens up. Uh, for, for Africa to, to get substantial employment creation in those sectors. Uh, and that's going to be in, well, probably secondary cities, <laughs> in, in line with uh, Vernon's comment, and almost surely coastal cities. Now, uh, but then you obviously look around the continent and think, well, how many secondary coastal cities are there in Africa? And you don't come up with very many, um, which does suggest... In, 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 in Tanzania, it suggests Bagamoyo, you know, the, the doing things to make the secondary cities that have coastal access uh, relatively clean plate, re relatively low costs uh, to, to get into manufacturing, you know, re really making those places such as they are um, work. So I think it matters. Tony Addison from Wider in Helsinki. Uh, question for really anybody on the panel. Um, is there a, a city in the developing world, particularly the low-income developing world, that you would say is a really great example for Africa and what can be done in city development? No. <laughs> <laughs> As a rule, all uh, least livable cities belong to low-income, densely populated countries. Now, among them, uh, you cannot choose country, uh, cities which are really very good and livable. But um, mm, I can think of Calcutta, Kolkata in India, which over the years have improved quite a lot in terms of uh, hygiene, sanitation, cleanliness, because of, I think, um, concerted effort and uh, creating awareness among citizens to clean their mm -hmm. own cities, taking responsibility for their local areas. So a lot of campaigns and good uh, city governance is required. In spite of the fact that I don't, I don't think that West Bengal as a whole has a very good governance. <laughs> we're allowed to have East Asia in that comparison as well, are we? Well, then, then the, 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 the contrast begins to speak for itself, doesn't it? No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say Chinese cities are perfect, um, and obviously many, many differences uh, between systems. But there has been. Um, huge rate of urbanization that has surely been high productivity and relative to African cities livable as well, delivering you know, services and better quality, quality accommodation. So there, there is an alternative uh, model there. Um, that would be my answer. Well, it sounds like I'm shifting the question on to someone else, but Vernon has a, a obviously worked on the decentralization of South Korea where you know, very deliberate policy was taken to, to you know, during a period of very rapid growth in the sort of late 60s, 70s, I guess it was, to, to actually uh, decentralize and bring you know, perhaps more livable secondary cities into play. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it said, well, this is a city that's uh, reasonably developed, but this is now a middle-income country. Yeah? 
I, I think a lot of, um, if you look, look at Latin America, that in, in perhaps a more typical process, that there is an enormous amount of cleanup afterwards. A lot of this is ex post. So you develop these slum areas, and, um, and then decades later, you come in and try and regularize them, uh, either by improving the property rights, uh, giving them water connections, trying to straighten them out a bit and put some roads in and stuff. And that can be a, a haphazard process, but it is often what happens. And, and it extends to the financial dimension, improving the institutions on the financial side uh, for local city finances. So often, you know, in Latin America, if you look historically in the 60s and 70s, these cities were just, you know, really, I don't want to use the word overwhelmed, but they were, uh, the living conditions were very poor. And we used to write about that in those days about how bad the water connections were and how unhealthy it was and so on. And now, of course, uh, it's, a, it's much, much different and much better in most Latin American countries. And in Africa, um, we've had this, uh, I, I want to call it rapid urbanization, but rapid growth of cities. And these cities that have quadrupled in population in 25 or, or, or less years. And um, of course, there are huge informal settlements. And I think it's an outstanding question that we don't know the answer to. Are they, in some sense, going to retrofit by bulldozing whole large sections of the city down? Or that depend on how good the institutions were to start with or how good the transport networks were to start with. And, um, I don't think we know the answer to it. Uh, this is a question for Tony. Um, the framework that he's presented, I think, looks very comprehensive and compelling. How does he see this being used by IGC for the research and policy work that is going to unfold from now on? Is this a kind of template that he'd like to see being deployed? Uh, how, how, how would it be used? I certainly don't see it as a template, um, and it's not offered in a remotely prescriptive sense, um, but I do think it important that we see cities as whole units where the different bits should fit together, uh, may or may not, and we have to ask the questions about you know, the mechanisms that cause them to fit together and where that fails. Um, so certainly not a template, but thinking needs to see the city as a whole. There's a danger of just saying, well, we'll do a bit of slum clearance, a bit of slum improvement. You know, just completely fragmented thinking uh, by researchers uh, and by policymakers. I mean, if you think about the urban stuff, the, that, 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 sorry, not the urban, the, the residential, that, that list of issues I went through, I mean, they span for every government department you can think of, you know, through financial intermediation, through law, through. Um, so seeing it as a whole, both on the research side and the policy making side, uh, I would argue for in whatever logically coherent and hopefully slightly evidence-based framework people uh, develop. Thank you. Uh, very interesting yes, discussion by all three speakers. Uh, when you talk about the, the outlook for African cities where the supply is going to grow by trade, um, we have this issue of fall versus density. Density is an economic issue. Density is very low. Uh, so one would say, well, let's build tall buildings. And you told us, well, no, there are market imperfections here uh, in terms of property rights and financing and so forth. What are the trade-offs to 
trying to reduce the, the effect of sprawl and increase the density in, in this case. Um, you mentioned Dar es Salaam. This city just seems to go forever. Yeah. And there are these little satellites every once in a while where you'll see a six-story building. And I, I, you know, driving past these, I went like, what enables someone to build a structure that high? You know, there's several of them together. There's some agglomeration, some satellite feature. What, what's taking place here? Do you, does somebody know? I, I'm just curious. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure I call it all, all of that. I mean, at the, the, the end, you're asking, I mean, sort of Dallas Arm, these little satellites popping up. I, I, I don't know, but I conjecture that is simply traffic congestion in the centre. Right? The centre has got so bad that you put your, you, know, you can't put an office block there. You put it those over these little sort of stumpy satellites are, uh, are, are developing around. But that, that's conjecture. But I think your main question was, yeah, the trade-off between density and what well, the, the, the the other side of the other side of that trade-off. I mean. Well, yeah, d density, I obviously talked about, you know, there's, there's connectivity between firms and the agglomeration stuff, connectivity between firms and workers in terms of you know, getting to jobs and making things work. There's also the environment stuff that I didn't mention at all, but as you'll know, there was that you know, report, Calderon report, end of last week, at the weekend, uh, really making the, the, the environmental case uh, for, for dense cities. So what were their numbers? Public transport in Atlanta or somewhere was what seven and a half tons of CO2 per person per year transport in Barcelona was 0 0.75 tons of CO2 per year anyway so I'm putting that there, there all the things on the plus side of the, of the trade-off um, but yeah there, there's 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 construction cost on, on on the other side I mean you're not talking about making African cities Hong Kong um, so, you know, sort of 50-story blocks, that's for sure. Um, but you are talking about making them, you know, f five or six stories, whatever you can get to without elevators <laughs> um, with, you know, dense commercial residential activity together rather than, well, you obviously know Dar es Salaam, just that sort of sprawl that goes, single-story sprawl that, that goes on. Actually, I, I just wanted to sort of connected, but I wanted to make sure that we got to the secondary cities question because um, I think it's a really important one. And, and um, but it also raises a question in my mind that I wanted to, <laughs> if it's okay, I can also ask, ask a question of this group, which is, um, so secondary cities are, are just tremendously important in Zambia. There's been a lot, a lot of talk about them. And a lot of them have, have been uh, obviously in the Copper Belt and related to the mining industry. So there are now people who work for the mining firms that we met with, for example, who call themselves city planners. Like they are city builders. They're town builders. They don't see themselves as anything other than that. And what they are trying to do, or what they, what they say they're trying to do, is to build cities so that when the mining firms need to leave, that the city will still sustain, which involves a lot of, they have, for example, incubation labs. They have entrepreneurship schools. They, and, um, and, and so it's a... I guess it raised this question of how much deliberate planning can go actually into these secondary cities. It does seem like an extraordinary opportunity for us to think what's the best of what we've learned and put it into these new cities. And there seem to be people whose whole job is to do that. But it also raises this question of sort of the organic growth versus a, a kind of planned growth. May, may I just add one, one comment? Uh, um, Professor Henderson's um, comment about secondary cities, how to create it. One of the problem we have seen is that um, normally one would expect that uh, creating more infrastructure countrywide will facilitate dispersion. But if you remember the um, role produces, role produce uh, the um, world economic order uh, about uh, backwash effect and um, what was it? Uh, spread effect. It can it can happen, happen here also. If you have more accessibility, 
Maybe everybody will come to um, the one major city rather than having the spread of that. This is something we have seen already in some countries. And uh, um, again, but I can, uh, uh, should I ask um, uh, Tony one question? Are those days gone when there were uh, cities to be made by dictators like Quezon City or Islamabad or Napigo or something? Mm -hmm. and, uh, do, do they, uh, do they help? I think Ramkish actually in the region has one final question. Yes. 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 Thanks for a terrific panel. This has been great. Uh, one of the things I, w when we think about productivities of the cities as a, as a concept, um, the old literature used to focus a lot on the rate of migration. As, and I would have thought that that would be kind of a determinant of, in a way, the productivity of the city. Because if you think about rapid uh, rural urban migration uh, as a variable, uh, that uh, would, it seems to me, lead to either uh, productive use of labor if the rate of manufacturing growth is right, uh, quite high or service sector growth is quite high in high productivity areas, or it might not. The issue that, I was, that I've always been sort of bothered about by the city discussion is that we really haven't thought about its relationship to ag the growth rate of agricultural productivity. Uh, is that a variable we should be paying attention to at all? The second uh, element in this discussion, which somehow uh, I find missing, is that when we think about the, the good contagion. Often the literature that I've uh, read on, on cities that uh, focuses on the importance of bringing kind of smart, educated people together to spread ideas and tap into global ideas and whatever. This seems to me to raise the stakes for education uh, and uh, because that also would be a key determinant. Should we be thinking about agricultural productivity, uh, the rate of migration, and education as being really important for the city's agenda? And if so, how do we frame those questions? Okay, so I don't think that, because we're running out of time now, but I don't think we have a wrap-up comments from, the, from Professor Venable and from you in this past session. Okay. Yeah, and after Richard. Uh, yeah, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, the uh, policy makers, researchers, whatever, have, have, have obviously have to focus uh, on, on particular elements. So uh, on D Daniel List, agriculture, well, yes, a bit. Education, surely, big time, yes. And you know, educating people and retaining them. I mean, talking to some of the people from Bihar last night. They're educating people, but the city is less attractive than Delhi, and, and they lose them. That obviously being a problem that uh, the UK is something big time or benefits from, depending on whether you're, you're in London or, 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 or elsewhere. So yeah, I mean, it, it, clearly uh, all these things matter. Let me. Uh, the, the, okay, the, the, the secondary cities mm -hmm. seem to be cropping up big time. I mean, there's a sort of blindingly banal remark which I think is sort of fundamental. You've got to do these things where people want to go. Yes. Um, now, you know, northern European experience with declining mining towns is not very promising. Um, now maybe they weren't designed very nicely, <coughs> um, but even if they've been designed nicely, they, you know, the, the experience isn't good. Um, Similarly, you know, places built by dictators, well, maybe they work, or maybe they're you know, in the middle of nowhere and, 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 and don't. So you've, you've, you've got to ask you the question, you know, what are people going to do in these places, uh, and are they close enough to their existing social networks and economic networks, which maybe, well, the gentleman asked about coasts, the coast I think, I think they had left, but you know, they, they, they have to be not in the middle of nowhere, not dreamed up by dictators, and probably not in declining mineral-rich regions either. First of all, I think uh, we had an excellent, pretty outstanding session. Um, the interesting thing about cities is there is a lot of uh, experimentation going on worldwide. I can think of my own country, Brazil, that have maybe 
10, 12 cities which are rethinking their design, their functions, their design, how to optimize a city for <coughs> aglomeration. Um, I can think of Latin America, I can think of Bogota, which is a very interesting experiment on its own in the last 15 to 20 years that has really uh, you know, brought about major changes in the quality of living, but also if I can think of Lima in Peru, which would be a bit of a basket case and now it's being reinvented. So I think it's a great time for us at the IGC to jump in in a big way into this issue. And I'd like to thank everybody and I'd like to make a very short announcement. Uh, the Tanzania session will now take place in room 1.09 first floor. Thank you for all and have a great afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I was there in July and I had been, I hadn't been there for 13 years and I could not believe the difference. Like 13 years ago I could not walk anywhere, I was super scared of everything. But now it's like the most vibrant, extraordinary city. Yeah. Well, Pat is really showing how you know, dictators can use isolation to protect themselves and then trying to get into some more accountability. So the discussion about secondary cities or